Welcome to Gamecock Pod Live. For the next three to four years, I'll be committed to the University of Okay, uh, This is Rogers again to the 25, 20, 15, 10. Rogers scores! Jackie Bradley Jr. delivers for the Gamecocks. Lost it up, looking for Kelly. South Carolina is sending shockwaves through the SEC. That's a win! Unbelievable! I don't believe it! And now, live from Studio 54 of the Gamecock Pod Studios, here's the cockfather himself, Keith Alsep. All right, everybody, welcome in to Gamecock Pod Live, episode number 1162 of Gamecock Pod Daily and now Gamecock Live. In just a couple of minutes, we will be joined for the first time ever on the show, 24-7 sports national college football writer Brad Crawford will be coming in and he will be addressing a number of topics on the Gamecocks and the SEC. Go ahead and get your questions ready at the Nana's Porch chat box. Nana's Porch, a full-service catering company, servicing the greater Charlotte, North Carolina ever or area, whether it's banquets, corporate events, golf tournaments, weddings, the North North Carolina Specialty Food Association. Check them out at nanasporch.com. Great pimento cheese. Voted uh, the best food truck in the Charlotte area. Jump in on the Nana's Porch chat box. And when you're in Charlotte, go by and check them out. All right, some news and notes to start off the day. Gamecock baseball, no power outage yesterday. Five more home runs in a 19-3 pounding of Winthrop. The Gamecocks moved to 4-0. and Two home runs by Ethan Perry en route to that blowout win. Freshman Eli Jerzenbeck made his much-anticipated debut on the mound, going four innings, surrendering just one run, no walks, and four strikeouts in four innings pitched. Caleb Denny, Cole Messina, and Braylon Wimmer also went yard for the Gamecocks on a day where five different players had multiple RBI performances. Eli Jones picked up the win, going two and two-thirds innings while allowing just one earned run. Gamecocks take on Queens University today at 4 p.m., streaming on the SEC Network Plus at Founders Park. James Hicks will take the mound for the Gamecocks. And tonight at 9 p.m. on ESPN2, Gamecock men's basketball will take on number two, Alabama. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our special guest for the first time, Brad Crawford. Hey, Keith. Brad, how's it going, my man? I'm doing well today. How about you? Probably better than I deserve, my friend, for sure. All right, so for our viewers or our listeners, as this will go up also on, in podcast form on Apple Podcast and Spotify, tell our listeners and our viewers about your background. 
Yeah, man, I don't I don't get a chance to uh, describe myself too often on these things. Normally we talk right about football, but I'll I'll gladly, man. I uh, graduated from UNC Pembroke, a small Division two here in North Carolina. I I'm out of Fayetteville. I uh, grew up watching the Gamecocks. I was born in Charleston, grew up sort of in Monk's Corner, moved to Fayetteville later in life. Got my first job at a newspaper in Lumberton, North Carolina, moved to Orlando, wrote for the SEC there, and then CBS and 24-7 Sports hired me back in 2015. So um, I'm entering year eight football season this fall with 24-7 and uh, looking forward to it, man. All right. So I, I generally try to ask every person this question. And so growing up as a Gamecock fan, do you remember the moment – you fell in love with Carolina football. Um, let me tell you a negative moment first, and then I'll take the moment. <laughs> as well. So my, my first game, I want to say it was late 90s. My, my dad's a graduate of South Carolina. I want to say class of 1978. And uh, Gamecocks lost a night game at williams Bryce, 45 to nothing. That was my first game against Mississippi State. And I rode home to Charleston that night telling my dad, this is the team you're pulling for, man. Like, this is the one that I have to grow up liking. And uh, ever since then, man, me, me and my dad, our, our favorite pastime before I got into college football was, of course, following the Gamecocks and attending home games. And since I've been in the sport the last 10 years, few few opportunities to do that because I cover college football from a national standpoint. But, you know, still, still follow South Carolina very closely and, now that Shane Beamer has this program, the top 25, hopefully can make it to a lot more games coming up. No doubt. So let's talk Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks. He comes in, he takes over a program that was four and eight and two and eight. And in year one, he wins as many games as they won the last two years combined. Yeah. And then, even before that epic beatdown of North Carolina and the Dukes Mayo Bowl, they get Spencer Rattler, Austin Stogner. It basically, Gamecock Twitter owned the internet for about 48 hours yeah. right before National Signing Day. Um, just your thoughts quickly on year one and then – that just unbelievable performance against UNC with DeCary and Joyner at quarterback. Yeah, I think toward the end of year one, Keith, the, the biggest thing for me was you started seeing national analysts that maybe never turned their eye to Columbia all of a sudden start looking at the Gamecocks for really the first time since late in the Steve Spurrier era back in 2013. That was the last real difference-making season, the third year of that 11-2 and two spree they had there under, under Spurrier. Beamer had momentum after that seven and six, took a basically team of 45 scholarship players to Charlotte and out coach Matt Brown. Nobody knew DeCarrion was going to start the game at quarterback, and, and he did and played really well against a UNC team that a lot of folks forget was preseason top 10 to begin that year, you know, with uh, Sam Howell as a quarterback. So, and then going into year two, Gamecocks obviously had momentum, had a very tough schedule, but, but somehow, you know, went eight and four in the regular season, was able to, to finish, you know, eight and five, that, that Notre Dame game. Very, very tough game there. But beating beating Tennessee at williams Bryce in November was huge. That opened a lot of eyes nationally again. And then turning around and double mashing it, you know, beat, beating Clemson, ending their 40-game home winning streak, and, and more importantly, taking the Tigers outside of the playoffs. So Shane Beamer's already done something that Will Muschamp did not do during his ill-fated tenure and that's beat Dabo Sweeney head-to-head -head and doing it in Death Valley. And I think Gamecock fans, Keith, will, will tell you, seven months out from that game, you know, at, at williams Bryce in November, they got to feel pretty good about that one going into it again. I mean, no doubt. So let's talk about year two of Shane Beamer. They get off to the one and two start. Then they rattle off some really nice wins, including – at Kentucky for the first time since, I think, 2012. Hard to believe. It's painful uh, to believe because, you know, Lou Holtz and Steve Spurrier really up until, I guess, 2014. Well, no, 
in 2010, the year the Gamecocks won the SEC East, yeah, they knock off number one Alabama and then go to Kentucky and blow a big lead and lose at the end. But the Gamecocks had dominated that series. Enter Mark Stoops. It completely changed. And I thought that was a really huge win for South Carolina, knocking off uh, Kentucky and then also knocking off Texas A&M at home for the first time in program history, uh, you know, despite – Five loss Jimbo, who I guess was six loss Jimbo this year. Um, you know your your thoughts on those two games and and for uh, Mark Stoops, we call him Little Stoopsy because that's probably what if I did my Steve Spurrier. Yep, oh Little Stoopsy, he's got it going on there. Yeah, I think um, everybody that uh, I think everybody that that watches the Gamecocks really the last couple of years, Keith has not seen a South Carolina team show up to an SEC road game and win at the line of scrimmage. And that's what the Gamecocks did in Lexington. You know, we know watching the Gamecocks for multiple decades, that's what it takes to win in the SEC. I know quarterbacks drive the league sometimes, pass rushers drive the league. But if you're good up front, you're going to win games in the SEC and and finish as a, you know, borderline top 25 program. Gamecocks winning that game at UK was huge. And then coming back, I think it was after an open week, to, to host Texas A&M night game at williams Bryce. that was sort of, you know, go back to 2017. I think Kentucky came to williams Bryce on a night game as well. Big game for Muschamp. Debo Samuel had that big touchdown in the first quarter, and then the game cost crap the bed. So that was kind of those, you know, what if that happens again scenario, and credit to Shane Beamer, man. He he had those players, that coaching staff, ready to go against A&M. They won a hard-fought game. And then, you know, despite that 30-point loss at Florida, sort of the head-scratcher game last season, you know, to win those last two games in November, uh, coming back from that homecoming loss at, at Florida the way they did, that's a testament to Shane Beamer having control of that locker room. And, you know, sometimes a first or second year coach, you know, they, they may not have that control of that locker room until year three. We're, we're seeing that right now with Billy Napier. He struggled in year one. Shane Beamer's already ahead of Billy Napier, you know, going into year three. So um, credit to him and, you know, Despite losing to Notre Dame in the Gator Bowl, I think all Gamecock fans who traveled down there saw a team that fought, you know, despite having a, a shell of a roster. I mean, no doubt about it. So let's talk after Texas A&M, you got Missouri coming in. And mm-hmm. I thought the Gamecocks kind of crapped the bed in that game at home, particularly in the first half. Defensively, they just couldn't get them off the field, couldn't get anything going offensively. Yeah. You know, you dropped that game. That was disappointing. You could have become bowl eligible that week, right? And then you go to Vanderbilt and you won. But Vanderbilt still rolled up about 440 yards of total offense. And then you go to the Swamp, and it is absolutely a debacle. And you're sitting there six and four, and you're staring number five, Tennessee, who, quite frankly, at that point, may have been the second best team in college football because, you know, their only loss was to Georgia. They beat Alabama. They had run the table in the SEC outside of losing to the eventual eventual back-to-back national champion. Isn't it crazy? I mean, going into that game, Brad, I mean, what? I mean, I know there were no Gamecock fans in their right minds, no observant college football writers or analysts thought South Carolina had a chance. And then, not just to win the game, but to essentially boat race Tennessee. Spencer Rattler, six touchdown passes. 438 yards. I mean, Tennessee closes the gap in the third quarter, and you think, oh, no, here we go. And then the Gamecocks rattle off 28 straight points and never look back on their way to what I think was probably the most shocking outcome of the 2023 college football season. 
I tell you what, man, it's it's one of the most shocking outcomes of, of my, you know, 25-year tenure as a Gamecocks fan. I mean, South Carolina was a 24-and-a-half point home underdog. That, that's, that rarely happens in program history. You've got Hendon Hooker. He was a Heisman finalist, you know, going into that game. Let's, let's face it. Then Jalen Hyatt, they had that storyline about him being from South Carolina and not being offered. That went viral. So, really, everything was playing in Tennessee's favor. And then the game happened. Spencer Rattler played like the five-star transfer that many thought he would play throughout the year. Finally came alive in that game. Uh, a, lot, a lot of individual standouts played well. And, and like you said, I mean, you know, us as college football fans, we view this sport on a Saturday-by-Saturday Saturday basis. The the ups and downs of, of Gamecock fandom, right? So after those three games you mentioned, it was that loss to Missouri, went over Vandy, lost to Florida. You're staring six and six right in the face with coordinator questions, not just on offense, but on defense too. And, I mean, South Carolina scoring 63 points, ending Tennessee's reign, you know, atop the college football playoff poll. And then, like I said, you know, returning the favor against Clemson the following week. I don't – I don't know what Shane Beamer told that team on the plane ride home from Gainesville, but I mean, whatever he said, he needs to bottle that up and tell it to him before every game in 2023, because that was uh, quite the motivational tactic. So, I mean, I know you have sources inside the program. I've got a few sources. I mean, look, I think, you know, Marcus Satterfield, his tenure at South Carolina was just very uneven, it right? Was. Like you would have like the Florida game. You'd have, you know, the North Carolina game where he just, you know, pulled a rabbit out of the hat with the Kerry and Joyner, who quite frankly, I thought should have had a bigger role yeah. from game one in 2023 at quarterback after what he did in that game. Obviously, bringing in a guy like Spencer Rattler probably changed that equation a little, you know, some, somewhat. But I think it was at that point, that was the breaking point. Like, I'm, I'm sure you heard some of the same things that we were hearing. Like, you know, there were over 100 plays on the play sheet every week, 15 personnel groupings. Yeah. Dudes trying to put in 10 more plays on Friday in the walkthrough. And – that's just paralyzing the players because it's not the NFL. And Marcus Satterfield basically had a cup of coffee in the NFL. I mean, he was a gopher for one yeah. year. And I think it was at that point Shane Beamer had enough. And according to my sources, they told him, hey, no more than 30 plays. You need to get input from the staff on their favorite plays and personnel groupings no more than four or five personnel groupings, quit overloading these kids. And I really thought it showed because at that point, Spencer Rattler could just cut it loose and play free because he wasn't having to try to remember 100 plays or maybe a play they hadn't called in three weeks. I mean, by, by the end of the season, Marcus Satterfield had one of the nation's best tight ends, Jaheim Bell, playing tailback. That That's what a disaster that – year and a half, two-year tenure really was. You know, I, I spoke to one of our Nebraska writers today. They are super excited about Marcus Satterfield. And, and I told them, guys, you know, just hold the expectations to a minimum. You, you need to go back and watch South Carolina's game footage the last two years. And I know the year before Rattler, you know, Satterfield may not have had a whole lot to work with offensively at quarterback. That, that was sort of a built-in excuse. But really through week six or seven of the 2022 season, the Gamecocks were one of the nation's leaders in, in three and out percentage offensively. And you're not going to be retained as a SEC play caller if that continues. So like you said, Keith, something something changed uh, coaching staff-wise after that Missouri game. That That's what I was told. That was the game where Shane sort of, I was told, put his foot down in the locker room and said, look, something has to change here. Uh, I was actually at a fall wedding that day, the only game caught game I've missed in probably 11 years. And uh, turns out I didn't miss much. You know, they had maybe nine you or sure ten did. first downs. So, uh, yeah, that that was the beginning of the end, I think, uh, that, that sort of uh, sealed the coffin for Marcus Satterfield. And I think somewhere around those next couple of weeks, Shane kind of started sealing, sending out feelers to 
potential OC options for, for next season? I mean, honestly, Brad, I started hearing the name Donald Loggins back in September. Yeah. I mean, yep. you know, the only two coaches on the staff that didn't have their contracts extended were Greg Atkins and Marcus Satterfield. You know, Atkins, I think, oh, primarily due to health concerns. Uh, but Satterfield, it was a, a prove it or move on type scenario. And, hey, it turned out great for everybody, right? He's going to Nebraska. Shane Beamer didn't have to fire him. You know, right. no hard feelings. He moves on. But, I mean, I'm with you. I think here's the one caveat I would have is – You'd have to hope, one, Marcus Satterfield learns that you can't overload players and what happens when you simplify. Right. But number two, I thought, you know, when you hire a guy who has zero head coaching experience, has not been an offensive or defensive coordinator, and quite frankly, a guy that's spending his entire first year recruiting yeah. Right, which we definitely saw the fruits of the labor this year and now for 2024 as well. You know, I just think it was something that if Shane Beamer could have said after that East Carolina game in 2021 when they have to get a walk-off field goal, hey. I was at that game, yep. You, you got to cut this out, you know, no more. Who knows what would happen, you know, either way. But now, first, let's talk about recruiting. Let's talk about Dowell Loggins. Yeah. I thought Carolina uh, completed the trifecta of the orange hush, not only by knocking Tennessee out of the college football playoff, knocking Clemson out of the college football playoff, they robbed Syracuse and the Orange of one of the top quarterbacks in the country and Lenora Sellers, a local guy, yeah. who, quite frankly, from listening to national analysts, if he doesn't break his collarbone as a junior, he's probably a borderline five-star recruit heading into his senior year. He blows up. Just now listed on the Gamecock roster, 6'3", 232 pounds, and he's 17 years old. Big kid. So uh, it's a big a big pickup there. And then in February, the rare big February announcement now, five-star Nicholas Harbor, which, I mean, the only, Brad, the only two guys I know to compare him to in my lifetime is uh, Megatron, Calvin Johnson, and Usain Bolt. And and I would I would throw Randy Moss in there too. You know we we still have not confirmed if he can, you know, jump forty five inches and catch one one handed like Randy Moss used to do. But yeah, man, that that recruiting momentum really from mid December during that early signing period through February was just insane. And you remember Shane spoke about maybe six days before Christmas. He told all Gamecock fans who were hating to just settle down. Like we're gonna get guys in here. Dow Loggins is a good hire. He's Shane's guy. And then five or six weeks later, not, not only does Spencer Rattler and Juice Wells and some of those guys return, but he gets Nicholas Harbor. And, and Shane felt good about that the, the entire time. Gamecocks were able to hold off Oregon and Maryland at the last minute. Um, I, I was told, you know, signing day morning around 9 a.m., Harbor's going to South Carolina. But then based on stuff that I've read and seen, you know, Shane didn't know until – about, you know, quarter to noon. So just um, great job by Gamecock staff there. Uh, stay and put the last couple of years on Harbor. Not only did Shane Beamer go to Harbor's football games, he also attended a couple of track meets. And I don't think many college staffs did that. So they like Nicholas Harbor as a track star, not only as a football player. So I think his future man is playing on Sundays. I think he's going to be an impact player for the Gamecocks. And I've told all my friends this. I mean, not since Jadavion Clowney have I been this excited to see a true freshman step on the field and, and perform in September. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, I, I think back they sent five assistant coaches to Lubbock, Texas 
which uh, is not the easiest place to get to, but I guess if you, you know, you're on your university plane, you know, it's all good. Yeah. But he runs a 60 meter time that essentially would have won the SEC indoor track meet last spring. He's, he's Jalen Waddle at, at 6'5", 235. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It is crazy. So Spencer Rattler, Juice Wells coming back. Gamecocks have added over 20 players to the roster with incoming freshmen and, you know, several transfer portal guys, particularly rebuilding the tight end position. So just your thoughts going into the 2023 season for South Carolina. Yeah, I think odds makers are probably going to have the win total somewhere around seven and a half to eight. That's that's about the right number to me, I think, based on the 2023 schedule. Not a, not an easy one. Um, you know, I've, I've seen some metrics call it the toughest schedule in the country. I, I wouldn't say that, but uh, I think it's one where Gamecocks can maybe get to eight or nine wins if Rattler plays well, if a veteran offensive line protects him, and if they find a run game. I mean, you know, losing – Losing Marshawn Lloyd, no doubt, is a is a huge miss. And while they did sign some running backs, they don't maybe have a guy who's a premier SEC, at least proven ball carrier. So I think if Rattler plays well, obviously Juice, you know, has to have a 1,000-yard, 75-catch type season. That's the biggest question for me, along with that defensive front. I think the Gamecocks have gotten better at linebacker. They're going to be solid in the secondary. But can they generate a consistent pass rush? Because we, we've seen Keith his last 10 to 15 years when South Carolina has a top 25 team, they've got some dogs on each side of the football at, at those end positions. And I think if, you know, they can generate a pass rush and pressure some of these really good quarterbacks on the schedule, you know, Shane Beamer can kind of keep ascending uh, as a top 25 coach and program. All right, so Brad, before we let you go today, obviously the SEC is expanding. Texas and Oklahoma are coming in. Yeah. Quite frankly, even later than I thought, I thought they would have maybe been in this season. But that's going to present now new scheduling models, potentially going to nine games. There's, you know, one eight models, one seven models, three uh, permanent six rotating. What are you hearing, and what do you think is the most likely uh, scheduling model? Greg Sankey has said it will be revealed no later than the spring meetings in Destin, Florida. Yeah, around around early May is when we should hear some finality here. Based on all my sources I've spoke to at at, at the SEC level, Keith. The Gamecocks, three new permanent opponents, unless something changes between now and the next, you know, two and a half months, Georgia, Florida, and Kentucky. Gamecock fans can expect to see the Bulldogs, the Gators, and the Wildcats on the schedule every season. I think we're going to a nine-game schedule, you know, six uh, rotating teams there. And I'm, I'm excited about the future of the SEC. I, I think it obviously gets tougher for the Gamecocks as far as, you know, those wanting to see this program win their first national title during the Shane Beamer era. but with college football expansion, I think there's there's more margin for error for, for SEC teams and what I, what I call this new super conference. You know, we're, we're going to a 12-team playoff. I think there's going to be some years where, you know, four, maybe even five SEC teams get into that mix. So game costs go 10-2 and two one of these next few seasons in that expanded playoff. That's, that's going to be good enough based on, you know, that, that strength of schedule. So – I would expect Georgia, Florida, and Kentucky to be on the Gamecock schedule every year. And with Texas and OU coming in, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, a, a flight to Austin or seeing Brent Venables return to Williams-Brice as the Oklahoma coach. So a lot, to, a lot to look forward to, man. No doubt about it. I mean, do you, do you think Texas and Oklahoma are ready for the SEC, the physicality of the league? Because I'm here in Austin – and I compare the Texas fan base to North Carolina fan base on steroids. Hey, man, I, I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and, and all my life I've heard chatter from UNC Tar Heel fans. You know, because when, 
when my family says Carolina, we're talking about the Gamecocks. But in North Carolina, you say Carolina is is Tar Heel blue, baby. So I'm I'm definitely used to that. I I think Texas and OU are going to be fine in the new SEC as long as they keep recruiting at you know a premier top five, top ten level. I, I will say for any Longhorns fans listening, this is the year to make the playoff if you're a Texas fan. You've got Quinn Ewers back. You've got a loaded roster, and you're not playing you know that crucial SEC schedule outside of going to Bama in week two, which I think that's a winnable game for Texas because Bama has a new quarterback. You know, they're trying to break in and, and whatnot. But I think OU and Texas will be fine in the new SEC, and I think it makes, you know, college football's most competitive conference even stronger. All right, so last question, switching gears on you here. Yes, sir. Dawn Staley and her team, 27 and 0. Insane, man. The only unbeaten in women's college basketball, 33 straight wins, longest winning streak in the country. Let's see, 14, 29 consecutive SEC regular season wins. They play their last SEC road game tomorrow night at Tennessee. They could become the first back-to-back champion and the first team to go undefeated since UConn in 2016. Yeah. I was in Dallas in 2017 when I think that 112-game win streak came to an end, and the Gamecocks cut down the nets on Sunday night. Can they do it, and will they do it? When you stockpile 10 or 12 five-stars the last few years, the way Don Staley has done, I mean – they are they are just obliterating opponents. That that went over LSU recently when LSU was unbeaten was one of one of the best wins in uh, women's basketball history in Columbia. And I think this year you're going to see a team that what's what's the magic number? Forty and zero means means cutting down the nets, right? Some somewhere around there, thirty eight and zero. So I think the game cost can definitely do it. And this is a team that right now is playing at such an elite level that anything less than a national title is probably considered a failure if if you ask Don. So um, this is a team that will get the number one overall seed and probably is a 15 to 20 point favorite against any team they play. No doubt. Well, hey, Brad, I can't thank you enough for jumping on and joining us today. I hope maybe we can get you back after spring football. Yeah, We'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, whatever we see from Dow Loggins, and uh, a very exciting group of newcomers, I think, for Gamecock football, both transfer-wise and some big-time impact freshmen already on campus for Shane Beamer. Thanks a lot, Keith. Appreciate the time, man. Absolutely. All right, that was Brad Crawford, college National College Football Writer, 424-7sports.com. All right, so I talked about some of those or mentioned some of those newcomers. So I think any conversation has to start at the most important position. And like Brad said, I do believe South Carolina has improved themselves at the linebacker position. But here's the question. Pup Howard will wear number five. Okay, last year he was listed – when he committed the Gamecocks at 6'3", 215 pounds. Now, on the most updated roster, 6'4", 242 pounds. Is he Jasper Brinkley, or is he going to be a guy that outgrows linebacker and has to move to edge? Gamecocks do need help at edge, But, man, South Carolina needs him at linebacker, as do they need Ole Miss transfer, Jaron Willis, 6'2", 235. But, man, a guy that played safety in high school at 220 pounds, he played safety, played inside backer, outside backer. He rushed the passer. A guy that played anywhere or everywhere on defense, uh, for Lee County High School, 
I think those two guys, it is absolutely huge for Shane Beamer and company to have them uh, in for spring practice. I mean, no doubt about it. All right, so coming back in just a minute, we are going to talk more about the transfers, maybe a little bit more about Gamecock women's basketball coming up right after we pay some bills. If you enjoy listening and watching the free Wednesday show, now live streaming on YouTube, and would love more Gamecock Pod daily, join our growing Gamecock family by becoming a monthly or annual subscriber. You'll be able to listen to the show every day of the week and listen to guests like J.C. Sherbert, Hale McGranahan, and John Whittle from TheBigSpur.com, Colin Taylor and Mike Yuva from Gamecock Central, Emily Adams from The Greenville News, Ben Portnoy, Michael Lanana, and Jeremiah Holloway from GoGamecocks.com, Michael W. Bratton, the host of That SEC Podcast, and many, many more. As a VIP subscriber, you can join or listen to the weekly live Zoom call with up to 100 of your favorite Gamecocks and friends. After the show is an unrecorded overtime segment where the real scoop gets dropped and discussed. It's like going down to your local pub or sports bar and having a conversation with your Gamecock friends about last week's football game, men's and women's basketball games, and Gamecock baseball. And of course, there's always recruiting to discuss. In addition to the weekly Zoom call, VIP subscribers get the most popular podcast, The Morning After, which is released every Sunday morning during football season, and more VIP perks are in the works. Follow Keith on Twitter at KAllset or follow the show on Twitter at Gamecock Pod. Go to the top of the homepage and follow the link. If all else fails, go to patreon.com backslash Gamecock Pod Daily. Join now and get up to three months free off an annual VIP subscription. You will love it, guaranteed. Now, back to Gamecock Pod Live. So, hey, guys and gals, let's face it. We are not getting any younger. I'm two months out from arthroscopic knee surgery. I'm a high school football official, a baseball umpire. And I've got to say, five diamond botanicals has been a lifesaver for me, okay. Um, Five Diamond Botanicals, founded by a healthcare uh, provider with over 26 years' experience, and they have got a tremendous line of products, not just for you, but for your for your lady and for gals. They got the bath bombs. They got body lotion. Okay, for me, I use the nano salve. After I take a shower at night, when I come off the field, I put it on my knees. I put it on my IT bands and hip flexors, rub it in, take a couple of uh, drops of the nano sleep aid, and I'm right off to sleep. Before I go out on the, on the diamond or on the field, I use the uh, Nano Roll-On, which is essentially like BioFreeze and Ben Gay combined with CBD products. They've also got a tremendous lip balm. The gummies are great to help you relax at the end of the day when you come in from just a stressful day at work. So go to 5diamondbotanicals.com. That's F-I-V-E diamondbotanicals.com. Your go-to CBD supplier. And look, we've had many patrons 
of Gamecock Pod daily that have ordered from them and they are repeat customers because these products work so well. FiveDiamondBotanicals.com, proud sponsor of Gamecock Pod Daily and Gamecock Pod Live. All right, so we talked about linebacker being a big need. Okay, what about safety? What about corner? Well, Gamecocks did not add anybody at corner um, in the transfer portal. But what they have done is they've already, they've, Torian Gray has gone back to back signing really outstanding groups of defensive backs. I mean, let's face it. Who had on your bingo card Nick Eamon Worry as the leading tackler on the team and DQ Smith starting 12 games? Bueller? Bueller, anybody? Hey, I don't know. Have you seen the video of Pup How or uh, not? I'm sorry, Nick Eamon Worry outrunning Amari and Brown, who is arguably the fastest Gamecock on the team, at least until Nicholas Harbor arrives. Nick Eamon Worry ran him down. I mean, this guy, he may end up being like Isaiah Simmons. For Clemson, like you really didn't want to throw that out for a, a three-star guy. I think Charles Power from on three had bumped him up into the top 100 as a four-star guy, but that was the about the only service that had Nick Eamon Worry as a four-star prospect. He had he comes out of the blue and just blows up and probably played as well or better than any Gamecock on defense okay well there's another guy that's on campus right now named Jalen Kilgore 6'1 207 from Eatonville Georgia that the Gamecocks beat Clemson and Oklahoma for he's going to wear number 24 and I re- quite frankly wouldn't be shocked if he's not the other starting safety back there with Nick Eamon Worry. Okay, unless Peyton Williams beats him out, which I couldn't rule that out either because he's a big-time player from 6A football up in the Dallas Metroplex at uh, Rockwall Heath High School. He played well against Tennessee when Eamon Worry got ejected uh, for targeting But, man, I'm telling you, Brent Venables, he knows defensive players, okay? And there's no chance he's leaving Norman, Oklahoma and flying over the states of Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi to land uh, in Augusta, Georgia, and go to Eatonville to recruit Jalen Kilgore unless he is a big-time player. So, Pup Howard, definitely a newcomer to watch, but – Maybe a, a guy that's sneaking under the radar for me is Jalen Kilgore. Can't wait to see what he does during spring practice. Obviously, as Brad said, the Gamecocks need help at edge and on the defensive front. Last year, Clayton White's defense gave up almost 200 yards per game on the ground. Gamecock signed the number one junior college defensive lineman in the country in Elijah Davis. He's going to wear number 11. I kind of got juiced on National Signing Day when he's listed 6'3", 262, because I'm thinking, hey, that guy's going to be a defensive end. Well, now on the most updated roster, he's listed as a defensive tackle at 6'3", 285. I think the Gamecocks need to to look at him and talk a Hemingway and try to lean those two guys up uh, to be in the rotation opposite of Jordan Strong and a guy that I think is going to have to play by default in freshman Desmond Yumi Azulu out of the DMV, 6'6", 240, who absolutely had a monster senior year. 
And quite frankly, this is a guy that turned down Ohio State, okay, to come to South Carolina as long as a lot of, as well as a lot of other big time programs. I think he's a guy that you got to look at as a newcomer. I mean, hey, the Gamecocks have got to get something out of Terrell Dawkins, who they got in the portal last year. He was injured. Okay, but prior to his injury, after going through spring ball and summer workouts, he was five out of five guys on the depth chart going into that season behind Strong, Birch, Gilbert Edmond, and Tyreek Johnson. Then it was Terrell Dawkins. And so I think, you know, Tyreek Johnson has flashed at times. I thought he flashed in the Duke's Mayo Bowl, uh, was forced into action in the bowl game, uh, really didn't hurt the Gamecocks there. Uh, but, but it's really time for him to step up and the Gamecocks need it. I do think they will continue to be active in the May transfer portal period to try to add maybe even multiple edge rushers because you don't know what the status of Montague Rames is going to be, who is a guy that, quite frankly, in the weight room was ahead of Yumi Azulu and a guy that I kind of compared favorably to Cliff Matthews coming in as a true freshman. You know, obviously that situation with those three guys is going to play out uh, during the – you know, the legal process, it's got to uh, play out there. And so, you know, that will be an interesting situation to follow um, with all, all three of those guys. And so, you know, Gamecocks need every edge rusher they can get. So sticking on defense, a guy that I'm excited about is Xavier McLeod. Okay, he won Mr. Football in South Carolina. He's listed on the roster 6'5", 320. I think this guy could be a combination of Jalen Carter and maybe even eventually Jordan Davis. I think he's a guy that, you know, if Clayton White has to go with more three-man fronts this year, I think he's a guy that you could plug in behind Nick Barrett uh, at that nose or one technique with Boogie Huntley and Tonka Hemingway playing down. And maybe you've got, you know, a Jaron Willis at an outside linebacker, uh, Pup Howard, Mo Caba, Stone Blanton, you know, maybe another guy slides outside in a in a three four look i do think dq smith you ideally want to keep him at that nickel spot but i'm just telling you okay kirby smart in georgia alabama lsu everybody in the southeast they wanted xavier mcleod because you know at the beginning of the season, you heard all these things. Oh, he's not a great teammate. Oh, he's in trouble. Oh, he's lazy. Hey, it is different for a 6'5", 320-pounder in high school versus in college. Because guess what? That guy's going to be out there every single play. Okay, 70, 80, 90 plays. Are, do big guys take plays off in high school? Of course they do. But all this guy did was shake it off, bear down, and blow everybody up on his way to being uh, named, you know, a high school All-American, to being named to the Shrine Bowl, and being named Mr. Football over Lenore Sellers, who had an unbelievable senior season. And so I can't wait to see – even in spring practice, what his body looks like after three months with Luke Day. And then I can only imagine in August what that guy is going to look like. 
So uh, Jalen Kilgore, Pup Howard, Jaron Willis, Elijah Davis, Xavier McLeod. Those are the guys on defense, the newcomers that are in that I am really pumped out of my mind for on defense. Switching to offense, everything starts for me at the tight end position. After Nate Atkins went down, South Carolina had absolutely zero scholarship tight ends. Austin Stogner bugged out. Trey Kenyon gave up football. Jaheim Bell, he transferred out. He was a quitter. I mean, in a sense, I can't really blame him because for two years, Marcus Satterfield absolutely misused that guy, underutilized that guy. And so I guess we have to wish him the best. I mean, Jordan Birch bailing out, to me, not a very good move. But on offense, it all starts with Trey Knox, who I think is an immediate impact player. SEC experience, was recruited to Arkansas by Justin Stepp, was coached by Dowell Loggins, 6'5", 245, a converted wide receiver. He's a guy I think you can count on to line up in the slot to be that flex guy, along with Joshua Simon, 6'4", 242, a native of Dalzell, South Carolina, who has uh, spent his college career at Western Kentucky, a guy that's taught, caught a ton of passes there. I've heard nothing but great things about him. You've got Reed McKeska, uh, who played with uh, the five-star quarterback that was pressed into duty at Texas A&M this past season. He's on campus. And you've also got Nick Elksness, who's 6'6", 242, a transfer from Florida. So another guy that's SEC ready and a guy that you beat Oklahoma for. He stopped by one day at South Carolina for an unofficial visit and was then on a plane to Norman he loved it so much, he turned around and went back and got the rest of his family in Jacksonville. They drove back up, and he's signed, sealed, and committed. Gamecocks have a couple of really nice, uh, I think, uh, walk-on tight ends. Maurice Brown, 6'4", 242, out of the DMV. And then number 80. Lucas Voza, who is 6'4", 246 pounds, a guy that looks like he's got what it takes uh, to play the tight end position in the Southeastern Conference. As Brad Crawford said, Gamecocks desperately need running backs. They got Mario Anderson from Newberry College, 5'9", 208. A guy that, you know, we're just going to have to wait and see. Can he do it? Can he play at the SEC level? How long is the adjustment period? Again, you continue to hear great things. I will say this. If you did not listen to Taylor Edwards on yesterday's The Show on the Inside the Gamecocks podcast, listen to that. Great information there uh, and some stuff on Mario Anderson. To me, I love the pickup of Nick Gargiulo, the transfer offensive lineman from Yale, 6'5", 310, a guy that's a double major graduate from Yale and the captain of the Yale football team. There's only one every year, and he was it. He comes in at a position of need. I think that really could solidify the Gamecocks offensive line. If he can win that center battle, okay, then you return your left side of your offensive line in Jalen Nichols at left tackle. And uh, my man number 55, Ja'Kai Moore at left guard, 
Then at right guard, you could have a battle between uh, Trey Jones and Vershawn Lee. And then at right tackle, it could be a battle between Tyshawn Wanamaker and, and the true freshman over there who was the backup in the bowl game. So Gamecocks, I do think, have quality depth on the offensive line. And let's not forget Big Sidney Fugar, who I thought was about 335 pounds. He's listed at 315 now. He could get in the mix there. Eddie Lewis, we call him Eddie Lewis in the news. Uh, the transfer from Memphis, I think he's kind of a Josh Van type of guy, a guy that could be your punt returner, could play inside, outside, could be a vertical threat as well as a possession guy along with Juice Wells, Xavier Leggett, Amarian Brown, Dakiri and Joyner, those guys are back. Landon Sampson, Kylie Horton. You know, you're going to have some younger guys in the mix there at wide receiver. And, hey, let's not forget uh, all those freshman wide receivers that will be coming in this summer, like Kelton Henderson and Nicholas Harbor. So, Gamecocks got a lot to look forward to, a huge spring coming up. Gamecock men in action tonight, Gamecock women tomorrow night on ESPN against Tennessee and what should be a raucous crowd at Thompson Bowling Arena. We'll be back with more on that. And football recruiting, still anticipating the Gamecocks adding at least one more player uh, to, uh, prior to the month of February ending. Gamecocks off to a hot start on the trail. Five four-star commitments. And I think plenty more to come. All right, so that is going to be a wrap for Gamecock Pod live streaming for the first time on YouTube today. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. This is our free show on Wednesday. It will go up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, you can listen. If you like what you saw, go to the YouTube page, hit the subscribe button. You'll get notified. Uh, appreciate uh, everybody chiming in. Robert, appreciate the kind words. Uh, Marion, appreciate you as well, as well as uh, Jay Diaz jumping in. Want to build that Nana's uh, chat box over time. And so thanks for tuning in live. Thanks for listening. God bless and go Gamecocks. Until tomorrow, this has been episode number 1162 of Gamecock Pod Daily and Gamecock Pod Live. One reminder, no Garnet and Blacktown Hall tonight. That is our live weekly Zoom show. Uh, won't have one of those uh, tonight, but we will be back on March 7th, and I can't wait to catch up with my favorite Gamecocks and friends on that weekly Zoom call, it's basically like going down to your neighborhood pub, pulling up a chair, sitting down, having a cold one, and talking Gamecocks uh, with the crowd uh, of regulars. And so uh, go to our Patreon page, join. You'll love it. I guarantee it. So this is Keith Alsep, and this has been Gamecock Pod Live until next Wednesday. And until tomorrow, I am out of here.